theme this week. Um, I'm calling this sermon Participation. Uh, listen for that theme. So to begin with, I think I'm going to start with who we are as Christians. There, uh, there are two things to consider when we take communion. First, who we are, and then what we do as a result. So we Christians are a distinct people group. We have a lineage and a family tree like any other group of people. Uh, <laughs> and our identity as a people, I think, begins at the southern end of the Euphrates River thousands of years ago in a city called Ur, when God called to Abram. In Genesis 12, <clears throat> God said to Abram, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Um, just as a side note, take note that this isn't part of any covenant yet. God is just making a promise to Abram uh, that he will bless the nations through Abram's descendants, regardless of how well Abram's descendants actually keep that covenant. Like This is our God who's made a promise to us, regardless of how well we uphold uh, the requirements that are placed on us. Um, he's, he's faithful. So as God promised to Abram in Genesis 15, the Jews, be, I'm sorry, the Hebrews became enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, waiting on the same proper promise of deliverance uh, that was made in that same passage in Genesis 15. And, and you know the story of the Exodus, you know the story of the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, <laughs> Veggie Tales covered it pretty well. But in Exodus 12, God commands Moses to have the Hebrews celebrate the Passover meal you know, with the blood of the lamb and the unleavened bread, and to con continue celebrating it as a reminder, first of all, of what God had done for them. He delivered them from Egypt. And second of all, of how they had been united as a people in deliverance. Um, the same goes for our modern-day communion. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. Um, the Jews, they did as they were told, and year after year, they celebrated the Passover meal, uh, commemorating their heritage until about 30 A.D., um, and the Jews actually continued doing it. But at the Last Supper, when Jesus was sitting around the table with his disciples, uh, Peter, Paul, James, John, they were all expecting Paul, not Paul. Uh, his disciples were expecting the annual commemoration to their heritage as the people of God. But Jesus, he switched the flip. He gave a new command, and he ordained a new meal. Luke 22, 19 through 20 says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, The cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You know, of course, the disciples didn't understand any of this at the time. They were super confused. Uh, and then when the crucifixion came, their hopes were, uh, were dashed upon the rocks, so to speak. But only after the resurrection, when Jesus came back to them and opened their minds to the scriptures, uh, they, understood, they understood what all this meant, what that new covenant was. But we, on the other hand, having the benefit of both Old and New Testaments, are able to make some comparisons. We see that the Exodus is to the crucifixion what the Old Testament is to the New Testament. The Passover meal is to communion what the Old Testament is to the New Testament. But, and they're similar in this way. Um, the Exodus and the crucifixion, they are both our deliverance as a people. They're both the way that God worked salvation for us. And the, the Passover meal and the communion meal, the, la the Lord's Supper, they are a sign of our identity as his people. Um, Peter makes this connection. He, he puts it fairly simply in the days following Pentecost. When, uh, when he has gathered a, a group of Israelites, a group of Jews that are standing around. After Pentecost, they were amazed at, at the miracles that, that Peter and his friends were performing, and they had all gathered around to see what was going on. And Peter took that chance to explain to them the gospel. He gave them the gospel, and he told them who Jesus was. He told them that they had, that they had killed the Messiah. But he calls them to repentance. In Acts 3.25, Peter says to them, You are sons. The NIV says heirs, and I like that better. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Peter draws a line all the way from Abraham to the present day. He says, no, you are the same people. And um, 
you're the same people, but there's been a change. The fulfillment has come in this one Jesus Christ. So repent and be reconciled to God. And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And this is the blessing, that we should be called the sons of God. That's 1 John 3. That we are brought back into community with our creator and that there is nothing separating us from him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this, this is our celebration, the communion meal. Uh, N.T. Wright, he writes as Tom Wright here. He, he's writing to the everyday Christian in, in a book called The Meal That Jesus Gave Us. He explains that the taking of communion holds intention, the past, the present, and the future in a way that is central to our identity. Whenever we take the bread and cup, we remember that Jesus died for us, of course. And we choose at each communion meal in the present to die and be resurrected with him. And in, in the future tense, we remember that he is coming back for us. And we consider all these things at once when we take communion. He's coming back for us because John 14, one through three says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to and rep- prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that one day uh, I am where I am, you may be also. We, we have a place that, that's being prepared for us. There's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms and a big, big table with lots and lots of food. Um, yeah, culture reference. There you go. Our home is not here anymore. And now here on earth, we live as strangers and aliens. See First Peter 2 for that. Just as the Hebrews did in Egypt. We don't belong here. We gave up our citizenship on earth when we died with Christ. We don't belong here anymore. And this is why God gave these instructions for the Passover to the Hebrews. And remember the parallel, so this applies to us too. Uh, For eating the Passover, God said to Moses, In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Th- those are instructions for travel. You, w- you weren't ready until you had your staff, until you had your cloak like out of the way, and until you had your shoes on your feet. It's like a... <laughs> we're, we're leaving soon, and, and, and we don't act like it a lot of the time. Uh, imagine you're trying to go on vacation, right? Um, the car is all gassed up. Uh, you've got... Uh, you've got you know, all your stuff loaded, you're ready to go, and you're walking out the door, and you say, hey kids, come on, let's go, we're going, and they go, wait, I gotta pack. Like, what, why didn't you pack before? Like, weren't you ready? Aren't you being, aren't you preparing to travel right now? And this, and this is a hard issue, you know, it's not like we actually have to, like, put together a bug out bag for, uh, for when uh, Jesus takes us away, but we need to be preparing our hearts and living in such a way that our actions show that we don't belong here because we're not citizens of this world. When we come together to celebrate, we are to come ready to travel. That means we prepare our hearts out of which action flows. <laughs> so watch, I'm gonna count. Tickets are purchased, our luggage is packed, and we're leaving. Past, present, and future all together in a single moment, and this is communion. This is the sign of God's plan to reconcile us to himself, captured and commemorated in a single act. And it speaks more than any number of words can. I could get up here and like, <laughs> uh, what, like give a sermon on, commun- on communion every week, but it just wouldn't be the same unless we actually celebrated it, unless we actually took the meal. We are recip- recipients of his great blessing. And that is our identity in a nutshell. We are his people. And as long as we are, we are his people, but only as long as we are participants in his plan. And unfortunately, that's not something that can be said for everyone. So that's who we are. And now we come to what we do. We participate. The church in Corinth had a lot of problems stemming from their culture, from Greek culture, that just didn't mess, mesh super well with the church. And uh, Americans have the same issue. Um, 
for the Corinthians, they had this, you know, of course, this fascination with, uh, with money. Uh, Corinth was a market town. It was right there uh, on, a, on a trade route. And, and, and Greek culture had this obsession with sex and, and of course, power. It's, it's human nature. Americans also struggle with all those things specifically. The Corinthians had a divided mind. They would often participate in these idol feasts that were common to Greek culture, um, mostly for the benefits, right? That's why I imagine, you know, you know, for the food, uh, for the, you know, the interaction with, uh, well, the benefits were, were mostly those things that I mentioned just a moment ago. But they would participate in these idol feasts as well as celebrate the Lord's Supper with other Christians as Jesus had ordained. Th- this is the church in Corinth. They, they, would, they would do both of these things. And the problem was, they didn't really understand what communion meant. Because if they did, they wouldn't have one foot in the world and the other foot in church. By splitting, by splitting their time, they were in danger of losing their way and their connection to Jesus entirely. And it's for this reason that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 16-17. He writes about communion. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, there are many, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the bread. And so, and, and so here's the key point of the message today. This is what I'm getting to. Um, listen closely, and I'll try not to mess it up. What the Corinthians didn't understand, and what we often don't understand as heart knowledge, as heart knowledge, is that participation, that is communion. Participation is communion. By definition, requires that we get right in there and we mix it up with Jesus. And we get right in there and we mix it up with one another. That we step out of our comfortable little bubbles and become involved because that's what Jesus expects. And we'll go into that some more. Communion is participation. And participation requires that we are discipled and built up in Christ. That's the first thing. And then once we are able, we make disciples and we guide them to follow us as we follow Jesus. Part of Christian life is that we share burdens and our worries. And, you know, heaven forbid our time and money with one another. It's what we're called to. And finally, we, that we trust in God, that we trust God with the burdens of our sins and we stop trying to be good enough and instead just be obedient, you know. But why does participation require all that? Can't I just kind of participate by, you know, coming to church and taking communion, saying quick prayers, saying thank you for dying for my sins, Lord? Well, no, you can't participate that way. That would be saying, nah, I'll just pass on the gospel. I just want to go to heaven. The gospel involves this participation in one another's lives. And of course, it involves participation with the Holy Spirit and being changed by Jesus. And, you know, I have, I have some first-hand knowledge about this because I did this for years and years, you know, because I'm super old, but I did it for years. Um, Paul uses a word in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, which we've seen and we've heard before. Uh, I'll, I'll read 16 again. This cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? The, the word that he uses is koinonia. Here it's translated into English as participation, but in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. In Acts 2.42, it's rendered fellowship. Participation and fellowship are the same word in the Greek. So, So this week we're talking about communion, about the breaking of bread. But understand that Paul is telling us that communion is about active, messy, an ongoing fellowship with both our brothers and sisters in Christ and with Christ. It's not about the bread and the juice. It's not about the emblems. The, the root word of koinonia is, is this word koinos. And there, you can see how they're similar. Um, koinos is used to mean impure or unclean or unholy. Um, and remember, holy means to be set apart. So unholy would be not set apart. And all these are negative words, but that's not really necessary for the understanding of what's happening here. Koinos, and therefore koinia, have this sense of cross-contamination, of spilling over. Your life, your life spills into mine, and mine spills into yours. 
that's fellowship and, and that's biblical communion. It's, it's a posture of the heart. So no, you can't just eat the bread, you can't just drink the juice, say thanks and go home. You haven't taken communion if that's what you're doing. Um, we're, we're, we're called to participate, plain and simple. And the problem is many of us don't want other people's problems spilling over into our lives. We feel like we've got enough on our plate and this is all that we can handle. Like maybe if we were having a better week, um, if we didn't have this going on, if we didn't have that going on, I could have time for your issues. But in fact, that's just not who we are anymore. That's something people of this world think. So here, this is a small personal example, but like I'm able to tell it. Um, so ho hopefully it, it draws a picture for you. I, I used to have a hard time with my roommate. Uh, his name is also Andrew, but everyone calls him Wolf. They call me Birdie, but whatever. Um, I used to have a hard time with Wolf because Wolf uh, is an emotional dude, you know. I, I, I tend to bury my issues. I try to keep them under the surface and inside so that I don't really have to deal with them and so that other people don't have to deal with them. But Wolf, the man was used to uh, getting it out there. He was just used to getting it off of his chest and talking about it and resolving it in that way. The problem that I had with Wolf was that he wanted koinonia. And I didn't. And, and I was a fool for it. So for like a semester, and a quarter, a semester and a half that we were living together, I could tell, I could tell when he had something going on. I mean, I'm sensitive to those things. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm decent enough to like do something about it. So I could tell when he would come in and he'd be upset. He had a hard day and he would say something about it. And I would go, oh man, that's, that's hard, bud. Jeez. Okay. And then I'd roll over and go to sleep and that would be it. But eventually... I was convicted in my sin there. I, I, was, I was sinning by not talking to my brother this way. I was sinning by not allowing him to get his stuff out um, and talk about it with him and help him deal with it. So eventually, you know, I said, oh, fine, Jesus, I'll do it. And, uh, and the next time that he came in, uh, we, we would talk about it. We would, we would go back and forth and, you know, his things would spill over into my life. And before I knew it, my things were spilling into his life. Before I knew it, we had this relationship where I would handle his things with him and he would handle my things with me. And uh, by the end of the semester, I had fellowship with him. I had communion with him. I had participation in his life. I earned the right to speak into his life as he spoke into mine because I loved him. My life mixed with his and our cares became one another, one another's. On this, Paul writes to uh, the church of Philippi. In Philippians 2, 1 through 8, so this can be this can be long. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation, that's koinonia, in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul is encouraging the reader to put others before himself, to count others more important than himself on the basis of Christ's example for us. When we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we are to keep two things in mind. We are a people who participate in one another that is invested in one another in humble love and humble generosity, counting one another above ourselves. And this is because we are a people who are united and defined by an awesome God who desires relentlessly, relentlessly to participate in us. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 10, 16 again. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ that delivers us. 
The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? This is communion. Martin Luther once described our relationship with Christ like this. The third incomparable benefit of faith is that it unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. By this mystery, as the apostle teaches, Christ and the soul become one flesh. That's Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. And if indeed they are one flesh and there is between them a true marriage, indeed the most perfect of all marriages, it follows that everything they have they hold in common, the good as well as the evil. Christ is full of grace, life, and salvation. The soul is full of sins, death, and damnation. Now, let faith come between them, and sins, death, and damnation will be Christ's, while grace, life, and salvation will be the soul's. For Christ is the bridegroom. He must take upon himself the things which are his bride's, and bestow upon her the things which are his. Here we have a most pleasing vision, not only of communion, but of a blessed struggle in victory and salvation and redemption. This is the God who defines us, the God that has delivered us, and who has shown us how to live in a way that is pleasing to him, and who has given us this sign of his covenant with us. To take communion is to say that you are a part of his community. And, and community by nature is an exclusive thing. What it means is these people and not those people. It is like the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. It's the people who are inside the arms of God. It's an exclusive thing because everyone else isn't. To be a member of community, a body of believers under Christ, to be a member of a community is to partake in the actions of that community. That's what defines us. We are to be discipled and built up in Christ. I've gone through this before. We're to make disciples and to guide them to follow us as we follow Christ. We are to share burdens, worries, and our time and our money with one another. We are to trust God with the burdens of our sins and stop trying to be good enough and instead just be obedient. Acts 2.42, I'm going to read it again. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, koinonia, and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. These are the necessary actions of one who should call himself a Christian, a, a disciple, a part of the family. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 29. Remember the Corinthians had all these issues. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And uh, at this point, I think it would be a good thing now to evaluate whether we are doing these things or not. And if not, let's not lie about it anymore. Let's not pretend. If you're not a part of the body, if you're not doing these things, let's not pretend that we, that we are a part of the body. And let's not profane the bread and the cup. Let's keep the family name clean. Because we're here to represent Christ to the world. That's, that's Matthew 28. And we say this so that when new members come in, they aren't led astray by false Christians. If you need to respond to this, if you need to repent in some way, or if you want to join this body, um, this is your invitation, I think. Thanks.